And I'm just going to pass it uh, right to Amy. But with the reminder, please keep your uh, phones muted. Um, if you have any questions, you could do it through the chat function and go to meeting or email me, mgreen at gcpc.com. Um, and I'll pass it to Amy now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, okay, just so good morning. I'm, they just uh, are all muted. Okay. Um, so, as Merritt said or indicated, we are really in uncharted waters now. Um, while it's impressive, I think that the legislation that, that Congress acted as quickly as it did to pass this Family First Act, um, please remember as you're th thinking through these business decisions that. This is a bill that was passed in, in literally days. And any of you who know who have waited for legislation to pass know that it usually takes weeks or months even to get the simplest things taken care of. So while I think that Congress had really good intentions to try to uh, address some really urgent issues, there are a lot of answers um, that a lot of questions we just don't quite have answers to yet. And um, so I'll, it's, it's been pretty interesting in the employment law community because we've literally spent thousands of hours by now looking through and trying to review and interpret the law. Um, and we're eagerly waiting for the regulations and guidance that the Department of Labor has been promising. The first set of guidance came out late yesterday and it wasn't terribly helpful because um, it really just broke down some of the points that are pretty obvious from the statute. But um, we will, we again, anticipate more answers coming out in the next, uh, probably just in the next couple of days. Um, as Merritt said, none of the, the laws that were on the books before last Thursday were in any way thought to address any kind, any issues like this. So I'm going to go through um, what the employer obligations are under this act in, at a pretty high level, um, and then uh, try to address some of the questions that we are getting or have already gotten. And then, as Merritt has said, please continue to, to send in questions. Um, in my view, the two portions of the um, of this Family Medical Leave Expansion Act of primary interest to employers are the provisions that provide for paid sick leave and enhanced benefits under the what we would call the standard or classic Family Medical Leave Act. Um, they're pretty big. Um, so one thing that's important to note is that these are these changes are temporary. The Department of Labor has now given guidance that the act, uh, the requirements of the act, will go into effect will be effective on April 1st. We were previously saying April 2nd. I don't know how we got to that number, to that date, but they're now saying April 1st. That's important to note because it means that anything that you're doing now to help your employees won't quite count or qualify toward the requirements that you may be obligated to provide under the new law. So that's something to think about as you move forward. Um, it's also important to note that even though that these laws expand coverage, particularly under FMLA, to a much broader scope of employers, um, it's only the expansion is only related to COVID-19 and only related to um, a very specific need for employees. Okay, so um, I'm going to take these in the chronological order, even though that's a different order than they are in the Act. Um, the first obligation for employers is to provide paid sick leave. Um, to employees. And it's not all employees, let's be clear. Um, the new, new law applies only to employers who have fewer than 500 employees. If you're in that neighborhood of 500 employees or you're worried about counting to see whether it matters or if you're obligated under it, please reach out to us or to your own counsel. Um, so the sick leave is uh, typically two weeks. It's oddly worded and um, it's for full-time employees, employers will be obligated to provide 80 hours of um, paid leave for one of six reasons. And in a nutshell, those six reasons are if the employee is subject to federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19, that's, in my view, that's sort of the biggest and scariest of the requirements because there's not any guidance yet on whether that means a shelter in place order as some cities and, and states are now requiring. In my view and in view of all of the employment lawyers that I've talked to or heard from in the past week, shelter in place orders wouldn't qualify for, um, for this first bucket of leave requirement. But that's, that remains to be seen. That's one of the big things that we're waiting for guidance on. 
The second qualifier is for if an employee has been advised by a healthcare professional to self-quarantine because of concerns related to COVID-19, that's going to be typically employees who might have an underlying health condition um, and whose who's regular doctor is saying, you know what, you should lay low for a while and not um, because you're at higher risk of getting it or you're at higher risk of having a bad outcome if you get it. Um, and the third one is employees who are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and seeking a medical diagnosis. Again, that I love that limiting language there at the end because it's not just someone who thinks they might have it or has a cold or has been sneezing lately. Um, the fourth bucket is employee is caring for an individual who meets the descriptions of paragraph one or two above. The fifth is an employee is caring for a son or daughter who uh, or child, minor child because the school, the child's school or daycare is closed or unavailable because of COVID-19 precautions. And quite frankly, that's possibly that that covers a lot of people right now um, and number six is the one that i think will be least used but that's the employees experiencing any other substantially similar condition specified by the secretary of health and human services in consultation with the secretary of treasury and labor um, these these requirements apply to full, full, both full-time and part-time employees please note that it is all employees even if they came on board last monday they are eligible to for this sick leave if they meet one of the six requirements that I just talked about. Um, for part-time employees, the guidance so far is that it is uh, that the number of hours for which you, they are eligible for pay is based on their usual work schedule. So if you have a part-time employee who usually works 10 hours a week, then they would get 20 hours of pay under this legislation. Um, that changes a little bit if they have an irregular work schedule, and that's something that we can talk about separately. Um, uh, and then the biggest, the other th takeaway is that the um, amount of pay that you, is is capped. So that's a little bit of good news. Um, if you're, if the employee is is eligible for the leave for one of the first three reasons I articulated, um, it's capped at $511 a day. If it's for the second three reasons, it's capped at two. It's two thirds of their pay, capped at a maximum of $200 a day. The second obligation um, is. Um, an expansion to the current FMLA law, and we're calling this FMLA Plus. Um, all employers, uh, uh, again, up to 500, 499 employees or under 500 employees, uh, must provide 12 weeks of job protected leave, 10 of which must be paid. So typically, we're looking at this as the, the sick leave is the first two weeks of those 12 weeks, and the last 10 weeks are, um, are paid under this new FMLA expansion. The good news for small, especially for small employers, is that this paid leave is um, only for those employees who cannot work or telework because they're, they have a minor child or children who aren't able to go to school or daycare or whose normal child care provider is unavailable because of COVID-19. So if you don't have any employees with kids, you don't have to worry about FMLA or about this expansion to FMLA. It's also important to note that this expansion to FMLA does not apply to any other non-COVID related situations. So if you have 25, let's say you have 25 employees and you've never been subject to FMLA and none of those 25 employees have young children, our best read of this is that this doesn't apply to you in any way. The, um, under this expanded FMLA, those 10 weeks of pay um, are to be paid at two thirds of the employee's normal salary or rate of pay. Um, and again, that's capped at $200 a day for any employee who is uh, eligible for the leave. Um, one, one of the things I'd note is that, um, unfortunately, because of the way the rules are written, it will require employers to do, in some cases, an employer employee by employee analysis of whether employees are eligible for leave. Um, one of the big things that we're waiting for from the Department of Labor is um, a, a model notice that employers must provide to employees to notify them about this leave and to give some background about who is eligible. Um, and what we're also hoping for is a, a model form from the Department of Labor that's uh, a scaled down version of a, their standard FMLA form so that employers can be consistent in the information that they're seeking um, and expecting employees to provide. Um, if any of you are subject to the current or standard FMLA, you'll know that um, Typically, to get FMLA to be approved for FMLA leave, you have to the employee has to provide some significant information about the situation or the healthcare situation that's gotten that obligates or that for which they need the leave. We can't 
it's unrealistic and quite frankly unfair to expect the healthcare community to provide that kind of notice now. We don't want to burden the healthcare system any more than it already is. So in some ways we're going to have to take it on faith um, and and expect our employees to be trustworthy and and know enough about our employees to know whether or not it's realistic that they would need the leave. Um, there is some better news, I think, for much smaller employees, um, even though it is clear in the in the act that it applies to empo employers who have anywhere from one to 499 employees. There is a potential carve out for employers who have fewer than 50 employees. Um, certainly the biggest thing, the biggest good news is that we believe that it exempts those small employers from civil damages and litigation. And for any employee who chooses to bring a lawsuit about whether the employer complied with this, um, it, there's not the significant risk that there would be for a larger employer. Um, there's also a carve out for DOL is saying now that it will consider exemptions for small employers whom compliance with these provisions would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. Um, they can't, as I said, the DOL came some initial guidance yesterday and have promised in that that they will put out more significant guidance about the criteria for applying for such an exemption. We just don't have that information yet. If you think that you're going to fall into that bucket, I would encourage you to start making notes about specifically why you think that it would be, um, it would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. Um, the act also provides for job protection leave. Again, there's some carve outs for employees under, for employers who have fewer than 25 employees, but uh, you, as is typical with most of the employment related statutes, you can't discriminate against somebody who takes the leave. Um, and you have to return them to the same or similar position at the end of their leave. Um, the, now, all of this is in, a, in addition to any leave that you already provide to your employees. Um, and you can't require an employee to take any form of sick leave or paid leave that they're already entitled to before they take this mandatory leave. I suspect that a lot of you have questions about um, whether or not you can furlough or terminate or lay off employees before this becomes effective. Again, I'm going to reiterate that we're making the best of a unique situation and there, the statute doesn't address this issue. The guidance that we're giving now, and I believe that most employment lawyers are giving this guidance, is that if you truly are making business, legitimate business decisions that are non-discriminatory and are not made in an effort to avoid the obligations or avoid complying with these laws, I, we think that there's very low risk in terminating or laying off employees in order to save your business. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that people won't come back in six months or a year and bring some sort of litigation. And I'm fairly certain that there are plaintiff's lawyers out there now who are trying to figure out how to make that happen. But to the best of our knowledge, we think that there's little risk in making legitimate business decisions that might involve furloughs or layoffs or even terminations of employees because you simply don't have the resources, you don't have the work to do. Um, the other important thing to note, speaking of not having the work to do, is that um, the, neither of these leave statutes are intended to cover employee, or em, let's say, I'll, I'll say it this way, they're not intended to obligate employers who simply don't have the work for employees to do. That's not the purpose of this. This is really for employees who cannot work or telework because they're sick or because they have a minor child in the house. We do think that there will be um, some ability for employers to make decisions about who's eligible for this based on their, the form of the business. So I got a lot of calls yesterday about, hey, if my employee can work from home, can telework, but might need alternate hours, do I have to put them on sick leave or FMLA? Again, we're not sure about that, but we're fairly certain that the guidance will be, if you can be creative, and let people continue to work, that's gonna be okay and it's not gonna obligate you to, to pay one of these forms of leave. Um, one of the questions we got yesterday was about insurance coverage and um, the 
Act doesn't provide for any guidance for insurance coverage. If you currently provide insurance for your employees and you're in a situation where you're laying them off or terminating them, um, you will obviously have to comply with COBRA and give them COBRA notice and the obligation to continue at their own cost any, any health care coverage. I would also encourage you, however, to talk to your, your insurance broker or your benefits provider to see how flexible they can be about keeping people as active participants in the plan for as long as possible uh, before their COBRA period starts, because obviously that's an added expense for them. Um, uh, one of the other questions we got was how does this apply to 1099 or independent contractors? Um, it just doesn't apply to them. This is only for people who are employees of the company. The FMLA provisions apply to, I forgot to say this, only apply to employees who have been there for 30 or more calendar days. So if you have a brand new employee, you're not obligated under FMLA, but you are um, um, obligated to them under the sick leave provisions. So it's the two weeks versus the 12 weeks. Um, I see a question now that, am I understanding correctly that the 80 hours of sick leave is only for companies under 500 employees? Yes, that's right. Um, we're thinking that the, the legislation, the legislators thought that employers over, larger employers typically already have provisions in place and probably have the resources to be able to pay employees or, or make other decisions. So yes, the 80 hours of both of these provisions, the 80 hours of sick leave and the 12 weeks of FMLA leave are for companies with under 500 employees. Her, Amy, I, this is Merritt. I have one or yep. two questions. Um, sure. But just that have been come through to me or just sort of other ones that I know that we've been fielding the past few days and sort of more, you know, practical issues. So yep. and some of these I, I imagine will be relatively easy for you. Some of them we may not know the full answer yet based because things are still fluid. But so let's say number one, it's a restaurant. Restaurants had to shut down, you know, a week ago, mandatory shutdown order. All the employees are home. Any obligation of that employer to pay those restaurant employees? It, again, my view of it is, and, and the common view of it is, if the, if the restaurant shut down and literally isn't open and, and there's no work available, and that happened before April 1st, I think there's no obligation, that I think employers do not have an obligation to pay either form of leave to employees. If, for example, if however, the, employee, the restaurant is able to stay open and do carry out and take out orders or delivery, that changes the analysis and an employee who normally would be able to work but can't work because they're home with a young child, that would be a different scenario and that likely would obligate the employer. Yeah, so that was sort of part two of my question is, you know, you have the business that closes, but then you also have so many businesses now that the employees can't get um, childcare, so, they can't work or perhaps can only work a few hours a day. What are those employers? Uh, what should they be doing? You know, let's say it's a, an office employee, you know, who does administrative uh, functions within the office, but they, and they're on a salary, but they can't work anymore because they're at home taking care of kids. Well, if they're at home taking care of kids, again, after April 1st, then I, if they, well, it, to some degree depends on their job. If, for example, the person is a receptionist and the office is closed and you can't be a receptionist from home and that decision was made and implemented before April 1st, maybe even after April 1st, I think that these obligations won't apply. But if it's a person who is, let's say, an admin who can do, who can work from home, if they didn't have young children, but are obligated to take care of those young children, then I think it would apply. So are there almost the any other, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, so the other thing that we're wrestling with and awaiting guidance on is whether it's, um, again, some of you who know about FMLA, this makes sense, but um, FMLA typically allows employees to take in what's called intermittent leave. So it's not 12, it wouldn't be 12 straight weeks of leave. Um, this is where we really need guidance because many employers don't mind having somebody work part-time and take some leave. 
that's the piece that we'll have to figure out. You know, have you had any discussions with employers where they're almost considering taking certain actions before April 1st to avoid some of the implications? You know, is that something you... Well, I wouldn't advise taking actions to avoid these implications, and I can't be more clear about that because... <clears throat> um as i do think that that would that brings the risk of um either retaliation or interference claims and that's obviously we want to avoid but if you're if but to employers who are really struggling to be able to manage this or who literally and legitimately don't have work to do um for example some of our clients do behavioral therapy with kids or they work with kids in schools, or they do sort of one-on-one -on work, one -on -one work with individuals, they're, not, they're literally not able to do that now. Um, they have tried to come up with creative strategies for doing teletherapy, doing over Skype, but they're also um, sort of having employees stand down, or they're limiting the number of hours that employees can work, and reducing pay in order to, not to avoid obligations under these laws but because they, they they can't pay people no um but, I, but Mary, let me just add that that raises a point um that i wanted to bring up about how important communication is right now and how important the tone of that communication is um i i'm a big believer that being that communicating with employees and being as candid as possible and especially in times like this in creating a message of that as much as we can't all hold hands and sing kumbaya right now, that we're all in this together and that businesses are trying to make the best decisions that they can for both the health of the business and for the economic health of its employees. And I really encourage employers to communicate with employees and to do it in a way that is candid and sincere. Um, and even if you don't have much to tell them yet, telling, letting them know that you're sorting through these issues and, you, and, and you're hoping to provide guidance as often as possible can be really helpful. Um, I would also add on a slightly more negative note, please be very careful with how you talk about issues like this in the workplace, because while you're making legitimate business decisions, employees are scared. And sometimes when they, I, I, Mary, you can add to this too, we often see in litigation situations that some that some random stray comment about what was Congress thinking can come back to haunt an employer if an employee chooses to bring some kind of litigation about this. And it's not intended to imply that the employer doesn't intend to comply with these laws, but people are on edge. And I just encourage you to be as positive and as generous and kind as possible. Yeah. Um. I have two or three other questions, and then I think I might have come up with a methodology to allow folks to ask questions via telephone. But first, let's, um, and again, I'm trying to throw Amy some softballs here. No, it's fine. Um, you, you, a company needs to lay off half of their folks. Mm -hmm. How would you recommend doing it so that they don't get faced with a ace, uh, a, an age, race, sex discrimination matter? That's a great question. Um, so I think it has to be based on the work that's available and the people who are available, the positions. Always think about this in terms of the positions and not the people. So if the work is limited, if you do a broad base of work, but only one area of that work is affected, then you would want to lay off or reduce the work of the people who do that kind of work. Um, we always want to look for any objective and any objective criteria. You can also ask for volunteers. That's a little sketchier, uh, or a little harder to do because you, the wording of it is so important. You don't want to encourage people to not work, but if you, uh, sometimes people will say, "Look, look, I'm I'm fine. I can weather this. I know other people can't, so I will opt out for the time being until the situation gets better." Mm -hmm. So, and I think the main thing is just, you know, have a legitimate business reason for why you're making those decisions um, that can be justified. Um, yep. The, another question is, 
notification. So you're in a workplace with 30 employees, it's an office environment, um, and you just receive notice that um, an employee has been tested and potentially has um, COVID-19. What obligations or limitations does the employer have to notify folks that that person worked with in the past week? And are there any limitations from an employment law perspective saying, you know, you shouldn't identify that person, you shouldn't tell everyone? I assume the answer is no. No, I think you shouldn't. I think there's a difference between notifying that there's been, uh, that an employee has tested positive or been exposed. Um, I think you'd want to give as much information as possible about the most recent contact someone had with that, because that your empo other employees may have had with that individual. I would caution you not to identify that person um, specifically. I think, again, a broad-based, hey, we've been notified that an employee of the company has tested positive or has been uh, in self-quarantine because they've been, they have symptoms and their doctor has told them to isolate, but don't identify the individual. But be as specific as you can about when that person was last in the office and when other employees may have had contact with that unnamed individual. Good. Um, I know one instant, one circumstance we had with a client is they had a number of salaried employees, and since the work has diminished greatly, they've considered converting them into hourly employees, um, so you can still comply with the Fair Labor Standards Act. Can you talk about that a little bit as a, a solution in this, uh, as work is downturned? Sure. Um, so. For those of you who, yeah, um, this is a bit of a radical solution for a client, and I'm, it, it won't necessarily apply broadly, but we did have a situation where a client knew about 10 days ago that the work was literally going away. Um, they weren't able to, to do the work that their 25 or so employees do on a regular basis. The, all of those employees are exempt salaried employees, but the work that they do can be broken down into appointments and hourly sort of meetings. And so we took a, a novel approach and told those employees that though they still are doing exempt work, they would not no longer be paid their salary, but they would be paid on an hourly basis for the work that they do, including some portion of it. You know, so that, and that would include the meetings, but also a little bit of time for any administrative work. Uh, again, it's a bit of a radical and novel solution. And I think if you're thinking of doing something like that, I strongly encourage you to get specific legal guidance about that. It won't apply very broadly, but, and there are some risks to doing it, uh, but it, it allowed more people to stay employed throughout this period, albeit in a much smaller capacity. Um, all right. Um, I just had another question. Um, if you have hourly employees whose contract was suspended, what do you do in that circumstance? So in other words, I guess um, this is a company that provides services to you know, other companies. That contract was suspended. So let's say they're providing um, construction site services or other services um, at a hotel and that hotel has been shut down. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they, we've already sort of covered this. All those employees would be laid off, um, and that's what the company would do in that circumstance. So there's no work. Yeah, I think that's probably right. If there's no other work that, that, that the employee can do, I think moving forward with a layoff um, is, is probably appropriate and a relatively low risk. Yep. The other, before I forget, the other thing that the Department of Labor has said is that, especially for small employers, they're giving a window of at least 30 days after, April, about 30 days after April 1st um, for good faith compliance. So if people, if employers are trying to do the right thing, but may make some mistakes along the way and trying to correct those mistakes as they happen or in short order after they happen, I think we don't have a lot of risk that the Department of Labor is gonna seek to enforce any of these rules. We do, um, so that's a little bit of good news is that they, there seems to be an understanding that we're all finding our, our way through this. Um, following up quickly, and this is a, based on a question that was just emailed, 
um, we talked quickly about you know salaried employees and that we had at least have one client that's moving some of them to hourly. Um, someone just asked the question and wanted to highlight that for those exempt salaried employees, so they're exempt from overtime regulations, if they work at all during a week, you need to pay them their full salary. Yes. Well, uh, there are some exceptions for the terminal week. So if you are actually moving employees out of the business, if you're doing terminations, you don't have to pay them in the last week. You don't have to pay them for the full week if they only come in and work on a Monday and you fire them on Tuesday. You don't have to pay them for the full week if it's a terminal week of employment, but yeah. Why don't we try this? Um, I don't know if folks have questions who are on the call, but I think the only way to sort of do this in an organized fashion is alphabetically. And I've never done that on a call like this, but why don't we say if your name starts with an A, sort of like Amy, ask a question. If I don't hear any A's, then we go to B's and through it. And then folks can have a chance to ask a question. We can probably finish up in the next 10, 15 minutes, depending on if there are many questions. So does anyone whose name starts with A have a question? Hey guys, this is Anand with Adway. Uh, at least one question for now. Um, the When we say we have to care for a, someone has to care for a minor child, uh, what is the age uh, guidance on the minor child? Under 18. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, another question, someone with letter A? All right, anyone, letter B? Oh, and someone's asked me to look at the chat box. Hey, Merritt, while you're doing that, I wanted to add that one of the things I forgot to talk about already is the tax credit. So the good news about this is that um, any any money that the employer provides under these laws to the employees is recoupable under an, a nearly immediate tax credit. Um, and just on Friday, maybe or Monday, the IRS has provided some guidance that employers can recoup these payments um, simply by deducting the amount of the paid leave from the amount that the employer would normally have to pay through payroll taxes. Um, and there's some good information available about that on the, 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 the IRS website through the Department of Treasury. I would encourage you to look at that. I'm not a payroll or tax expert, but your payroll companies should be up to speed on that and can help with those issues. Again, I wanna point out, anything that you provide to employees under your own policies or practices and or before April 1st will not qualify for the tax credit. So just be cautious of that as you move forward. Um, uh, so uh, B, anyone whose name starts with B? Um, all right, here's the chat box. Um, here's a question from the chat, uh, chat box. If we cut salaries this week before the act takes effect, does this become the new base for compensation under the new act? So if we That's cut a great question. Uh, it's a really great question. And again, there's no guidance on this. I do think that that's risky. That would, I, I think that that would look like it was um, done in avoidance of these obligations, particularly because I feel like the, um, you know, the, the impetus behind this bill was, the understanding was that mo most of these obligations are, are for two thirds of the person's salary. So there is some relief maybe for employers. I think that's risky. Okay. Um, another question is, any advance notice requirements for the layoffs? Um, it depends. I think that this question is really probably related a, around the WARN Act issues. Um, it is, and we've not gotten any guidance yet that any federal or state WARN Act is suspended, obligations are suspended because of this. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, one of the other things I would add at the end of this or as often as possible is all of these kinds of decisions should be to the extent possible in writing. So, um, you're not obligated unless you meet the requirements of the war, the federal WARN Act, which is 
if you have over 100 employees and you're letting go of um, at least 50 people and that 50 people is at least 33% of your workforce, there's a 60 day notice requirement. I don't think that that applies to most employers around here. And other than that, at least in Virginia and DC, there are no, war no mini WARN Act requirements for notice of the layoff. But all such notices should be in writing. And so everyone knows, WARN Act is uh, Worker Adjustment Retraining Notification Act. Um, and it's rare that's become, a, uh, it's for plant closings or mass layoffs. Um, and as Amy indicated, the numbers are higher than probably a lot of the folks on this call, but it is something to take into account. We had a, a client that was a government contractor who lost some significant contracts and they had to deal with it within the last year or so. So it's, it's something to keep in mind. Um, here's another question. Uh, situation is there are no projects that can be carried out because of the COVID restrictions. Therefore, no work for part-time hourly employees. Plan is to tell them all projects suspended until restrictions lifted. Do we encourage them to file for unemployment? And do we need to add lingo if they do apply? So, yeah, I think you would notify them that you're instituting, let's say, a temporary layoff um, and that that likely makes them eligible for unemployment under, most states are expanding unemployment laws and, and eligibility. So yes, you'd want to notify them that they are, there's no work available anymore for them and that um, that they can seek unemployment. And I'm fairly certain that I just heard the other day that um, one of the small provisions in this is that op employers are now expected, if not obligated, to provide um, notice of how how people should apply can and should apply for unemployment so i've been putting for example when i'm helping clients i put a link to the appropriate unemployment office in any notification the employer is giving to the employee yeah. um, another question was um, if an employee has possible exposure but's not showing any symptoms would they qualify for sick leave Now, and sick pay, I don't know if that's under the new statute. Um, I don't think, again, if it's just someone who has a relatively attenuated possibility of exposure and has not sought help from a medical provider and hasn't been told by a medical provider that, that they should self-quarantine, I don't think that person would qualify for the sick leave. Now, that would be different if, you know, someone who, um, living with someone who's been diagnosed with it and can't, and, and, and the doctor says, hey, you really shouldn't leave the house, you shouldn't go to work and expose, potentially expose other people to this because there's the risk of having it, even if they're asymptomatic, is high, then that changes the analysis. But just the general, like, hey, I know somebody, I was in a meeting with somebody a couple weeks ago and I heard he tested positive. I don't think that would qualify someone for the sick leave. Um, the other complicating factor, let me right. just add, the other complicating factor here is that the language in both parts of the statute is that the employee cannot work or telework for these reasons. So if you've got people who are uh, you know, lawyers or consultants and they can work from home, even if they have the sniffles or even if they're not feeling well, that doesn't get them the sick leave. And if they don't have young kids, they don't get the FMLA leave either. Amy, for that, um, is it young kids for FMLA or does it also include uh, dependents? So what happens if you're taking care of a, you know, 25 year old special needs child or an elderly parent or, you know, spouse? So for the, for the FMLA leave <clears throat> provision, it is only for children who cannot be in school or daycare or their, let's say their nanny is unavailable for some reason. It does not extend to any other family members or for any other reason. Um, the only, that said, for employers of 50 or more who are subject to classic FMLA, if they have to take care of a child 
let's say, uh, let's say a parent, let's change it a little bit. Let's say they have to take care of a parent who was both diagnosed with COVID and has an extreme case of it, then they might qualify for regular SMLA. Um, but to the extent, again, what we know now, most cases of COVID-19 are relatively, um, have relatively low symptoms and people are, are okay. I'm not, or they're in the hospital. I mean, you know, it's one extreme or the other. <clears throat> um, we have probably a few more minutes and it seems like people still have questions and we're not having people drop off the call at all. So um, I think I've gone through the calls, uh, the questions on chat by and large. Um, oh, here's another question. And then we'll open it up to folks on the phone again. Is it okay to negotiate a temporarily reduced salary with a key employee if they're willing? You know, I'll say a quick something and let Amy tell me if yeah. I'm right or wrong. Um, as long as it complies with the Fair Labor Standards Act, you can reduce the salary, um, you know, to whatever limit is within that law, the legal parameters. Um, so as long as you're still paying them on a salary basis, salary level, you know, they meet the duties test, so you're complying with the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, then that should be fine. So if you were paying them, you know, two thousand dollars a week and you want to pay them a thousand dollars a week, that's out over that salary level. So that should be sufficient. Amy, anything to add? No, I think that's right. Um, again, I just want to make sure that it's, as long as it's not being done in any way that could be construed as avoiding these obligations. Um, and you should always put any change like that in writing and make sure that you're trying to the extent that's possible in these times to indicate when that will change, that this is a short-term fix and it's based on the business needs and that you're, you know, we will reevaluate it. I don't know. The date I'm using typically is June to say, you know, reevaluate whether we have to continue in this way or can return your salary to its normal level or something like that. Um, let's turn to folks on the phones quickly. Anyone whose name starts with the letter B have a question? Anyone with the letter C have a question? D. Yeah, hey, Merrick. Good morning. It's Daniel. San Daniel Sanders with Four Sales. Mm -hmm. How are you today? Good, good. Okay, so um, this negotiating a reduced salary, the Fair Labor Standards Act, is there a formula uh, to be used? Because basically what I'm going to do is reserve, We all of our projects are hands-on. Um, so we're, and we've talked to all the clients and everything's suspended until the Virginia state restrictions are lifted. We know that we could operate within them, but it doesn't seem morally responsible. Um, so we're suspending all the projects with the clients. Key employee, negotiate down the rate. Is there a formula I'm supposed to follow for calculating what that would be? Because I'm taking my salary to zero to keep cash in the company so that we're viable when we come back at the other end of this thing. So as Amy and I mentioned, you had to continue complying with the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, as you probably recall, that used to be 455 a week. Effective January 1st of 2020, it is mm -hmm. $684 per week. 684 per mm -hmm. week is the minimum that you can pay on a weekly basis that salaried employee. First, 684. Okay. Well, good to know. I almost made a mistake there. Thank you. Um, so that was D. Anyone with the first name is uh, E or F? This is Fabiola with Sondertech. Um, quick question with regards to how does it apply to staff members um, who are possibly at risk would like to take these, but um, since we're under the CISA guidance as essential uh, workforce, how, has there been any a chance to interpret it in that sort of sense? Say somebody who's um, in the age bracket would like to telework or would like to stay home because they're fearful for their own health and safety. Um, how does that apply? Or is that too good, good of a question? Um, it's a good, no, it's a great question. We don't have a ton of guidance yet. The only specific carve out is for um, healthcare workers that, that healthcare employers can, we think can um, tell someone that they can't have the FMLA leave. If you have an employee who is for a 
particular reason, you know, age or unrelated health condition, for example, is concerned about exposure and they can telework, then I think that's a reasonable solution. But if you have somebody who has um, an underlying condition that, you know, puts them at greater risk for complications from COVID-19 and they have a job that isn't telework ready, you know, isn't capable of being done by telework, then I do think that they would likely be eligible for the sick leave and the extended FMLA leave. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Fabiola, but I'm happy to follow up with you afterwards if not. Okay, thank you. But again, some of these are so very specific. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's really important to highlight is that, as we've said, there's so many variables at play here that there's no one formula to answer all of these questions. Um, you know, however much we would all like to be able to say, here's the black and white answer, here's what you do in this circumstance, you really need to look at the circumstances and you really need to call Amy with a lot of these questions, you know, and <laughs> hopefully she can very quickly sort of review the facts and come up with a recommendation, but that would be the recommendation uh, that you would do. Um, going through quickly some more, uh, so anyone, first letter G, H, I, J, K. Hey, this is Hi, Joe there, with this. Foundation Insurance Group. Oh, Sorry right. about that. Just a quick question. Okay. We, folks that are going to be going remote that weren't previously remote and are going to have costs associated with going remote, what is an employer's obligation to absorb those costs? I mean, we had we had someone try to submit us their their internet bill uh, the other day. I mean, we can't pay forty people's Verizon internet bills, you know. So I don't know if that, that's come up at all, or if you have any guidance on that. That's a great question, and I have seen um, you know, that is a it's one of the areas that we're sort of waiting for a little bit more guidance. I don't think it's unreasonable. Um, there are some regulations that discuss employers' obligation to pay legitimate business expenses of employees. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable for someone who has never worked remote and is trying to do work from home to ask for some assistance with maybe not the entire internet bill because that's not they're not only getting internet so that they can work from home, but if employers can offer, you know, a, to subsidize a portion of the expenses that an, an employer normally or an employee might not normally have, that's a good, I think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And this is part of what we've Thank also you. worked with a few clients on recently is updating or for some folks putting in place a telework policy. You know, you now have, you know, thousands of people teleworking who didn't used to. A lot of employers don't have a formal policy in place defining what is acceptable telework, you know, and a lot of those telework policies, and oftentimes it is a policy and then also a telework agreement that you have someone sign that, you know, defines what they need to do, that they need to have a safe working environment. You know, in a home office environment, you can still have OSHA uh, uh, issues that the employer can be responsible for. So it is something to think about. And if you have more and more of your employees teleworking and you don't have a telework policy in place or an agreement in place, it's something to either put into place or to um, potentially um, update. Um, someone Mary, else had a question? Joe Miggs, I got a question for you. Go ahead. So I, I sent you an email just a couple minutes ago about our contracts state that we need to go on site to support our clients. And obviously right now that's a problem. We can't do that. Um, we've had some clients come back and say, well, we'd like to get a credit for not going on site uh, on our bills. Um, we're a little reluctant to do that, obviously, because it reduces our income and ability to play our, pay our staff. But, um, and we're providing plenty of remote support for clients. What, what can we sort of state is there any anything that we can say that that sort of says you know we're are, are we obligated to reduce contract costs because of this or like what, what would your take be on that? You know, first uh, I would suggest that you and hopefully everyone else participate in the call next Thursday when we're sort of going to be talking through more of these business issues. 
Number two, I think okay. you need to sort of see the contract. We need to see, you know, their force majeure provision. Um, you know, we need to see the contract and what it might provide. We also have to determine the level of service. So your level of service is probably not decreasing in any manner. It's just being provided uh, in a different manner, in a different forum. You know, you're doing more remote than you are on site. Um, but I think we'd really have to look at the contract and see what it says in that regard. Uh, Lewis, I don't yeah, know if you're still on the phone Mary, and you have something to add. Yeah, yeah, Mary, I'm, I'm still here. And, and that's absolutely right. Uh, we need to look because it, it depends on the clause. And it's also going to depend on who's shutting down. Are you guys saying you're not going on site or is the client shutting their offices? Uh, and not letting you on site. And if, and if they were shut by by order uh, of the government versus if they made the determination themselves, there's a bunch of different factual questions on there. Uh, you know, so it, it, we see your standard contract. We could give you uh, give you a, a better answer. Great, thank you, guys. Was there another JK with a question? Yeah, Meredith, Katie from Wine and Dines. How are you? Great. Um, Amy, so quick question for you. And I had emailed into Merit, but I wanted to clarify on this. So I have a non exempt salaried employee, and I am in a position where I'm already forgoing my own salary at this point. I would like to try to keep him on board, but I don't have 40 hours worth of work or 40 hours worth of comparable income to compensate him for that salary coming in right now. Um, with what we do, I mean, we lost literally everything in the span of 10 days through the end of May in terms of our work. We're a catering company. Um, yep. So I'm doing my best to try to bring in, you know, hours here and there. But the reality is it's not looking like I would be able to compensate him, you know, for 40 hours a week moving forward. So are there legal options for temporarily letting him go from that salaried position and hiring him back as an hourly employee? Or is that something that legally you would not advise or it cannot be done? So you said he's non-exempt, but you pay him on a salaried basis? Correct. And that's, I assume, for ease of administration? And his own finances, yes. Okay. Um, so if he's doing non-exempt work and, he, and, and you just happen to be paying him on a salary basis, I don't think there's, and Merit, please check me if I'm wrong, but like, I don't think there's any risk really in telling him in writing that for the next however many weeks or months or for the you know, effective immediately and for the foreseeable future that he will only be paid for the hours that he works um on a, you know and whatever his as long as you're paying him minimum wage and yes. that if he works more than 40 and he should already be doing this too if he's working more than 40 hours a week then he's still eligible for overtime rate for anything right. over 40 but i suspect that that's not likely to happen right now <laughs> yeah okay so it's it my other question is is there rather than essentially reduce his salary to an hourly position at this point would there be any benefit on either end to letting him go so that he can collect unemployment and then under unemployment you can work up to a certain number of hours a week as long as it does not overstep what your earnings would have been if you maintained your position so is there is that a better approach to that? Or is it what you just said, where I'm not obligated to provide him with an exempt salary level anyway, so it would just be a reduction in hours and therefore a reduction in his income for the temporary time? Um, I haven't dug through all of the new um, employment, unemployment approaches to this, but my mm. gut instinct is that if you give him a letter that says your normal salary was X, but effective immediately, we're only paying you Y for every hour that you work, and we anticipate that you will work Z number of hours. Um, that is, in effect, a little bit of a, sort of akin to a furlough. And he can likely do both, co work those fewer hours and collect unemployment for the delta between what he's making now and what he was making up to now. Okay. So I don't think in the short, I don't think you have to fire him to get there. I think you can just issue him a notice that this is the change, and he can take that to the unemployment office and see what happens. Okay, and hopefully be compensated to make up for the difference, essentially, <laughs> to the extent that unemployment, get, yeah, would cover. Okay. And that unemployment right. typically doesn't, you know, get you back to your full salary, but it should help with that delta. 
Correct. All right. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. It's after nine. Most people are still on the line. So I appreciate everyone. Hopefully this has been helpful. I do want to just give folks uh, the latter half of the alphabet a chance to ask some questions quickly so no one gets <laughs> left out. And of course, you can always follow up via email to Amy or I. Um, but MNO, any questions? Hey, Merritt. Mark Stevenson, how you doing? Good, Mark. I have a quick one. It's, it, it may be getting a little ahead of things, but it's a question we're going to get hit with um, in the HR world in the coming days and weeks. It's um, do you guys have you guys had a chance to digest at all the what's coming out in the new stimulus package? I have, I not. have not. Amy or Lewis, I don't know if you guys have. No, I haven't had a chance. It's on my agenda for this morning. Okay, then I'll I'll I'll, I'll refrain. I'll, I'll get back to you guys at a later time. Then on that, I, I was just wondering. I mean, I'm concerned about the small business loans, really, and whether they. I heard they they could be um, end up being in the form of grants if you abide by certain um, certain uh, restrictions or, or don't or don't furlough or lay off a lot of your people. And, but I haven't. Okay. Any, but I haven't. I don't know if that's real or not. So that that was my question. Well, we'll uh, we'll certainly look into that, but one thing that I heard yesterday that might be helpful for some small business owners, um, and I have no knowledge of them, simply passing along information I heard from someone I respect a ton. Um, my understanding is that there can be a lot of restrictions um, and lack of flexibility on loans from the Small Business Administration. And so some people are some people are advising small business owners to look at banks first before loans from the Small Business Administration because there may be more flexibility in payback or, to Mark's question, um, fewer limitations on you know, not, laying, not laying people off or whatever the compliance issues are. Those are hard to, promises to make right now. Great. So let's go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I'll get back to you guys. Thanks, Mark. Anyone else um, have questions? So let's open it up to the rest of the alphabet. Going once, going twice. Well then, um, first, Amy, thank you so much. Um, I, I think this was wonderful and I appreciate your preparation, um, you know, uh, to prepare for this and helping all of our clients and giving this presentation. Obviously, if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to follow up with uh, Amy or myself. We'll send out an invite for next week's um, call on business issues as it relates. Obviously, if you have questions about any of your contracts in the meantime, don't hesitate to contact us. We've been working with a number of government contractors and other businesses on, you know, sort of effects of COVID-19, you know, a lot of conventions that are shut down, contracts that can't be fulfilled, um, both in private sector and for government contractors. So don't hesitate to contact us in that regard. We've also thought about providing a call on litigation issues. Uh, because all courts locally have been shut down. If there's interest in that, let us know. Um, so thank you all very much. And with that, I think we'll end the call. Take care and goodbye. Thanks, Merritt. Right, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Merritt.